You're listening to Southeast Radio's Business Matters with Carl Fitzpatrick in association with Wexford Insurances. Challenge us at Wexford Insurances, 0818 31 30 30. I'm now joined by Sherry Nugent from the Irish Quilting Magazine. Sherry, you might start by telling me a bit about your own background, please. Well, I'm originally from California. Um, I have always been in journalism and I do have a degree in technical writing. So being in California, I worked for some dot coms and I did some writing and did some publications there. Um, During that time, I met my husband, who's Irish. He's from Wicklow. So we got married. And uh, I think the deal was always that when we had children, we'd bring them back to Ireland. We raise them near his family. So eight years ago, uh, we came home. I was pregnant and had one baby in hand and we came back to Ireland. Where did the idea come for the magazine? Well, for the magazine, uh, when I moved back, I came home with some babies. And of course, my uh, husband's aunts had made me quilts. And I immediately looked at the quilts and thought, oh, I'd love to make those. So I sat down and I started taking apart fabric and stitching it together. Met some other quilters. It was a little bit hard to find a few of them. And we sat around quilting and stitching. And one day around the table, we were having cups of tea. And we said, it'd be lovely if we had a magazine here in Ireland. We often would wait for um, the import magazines to come and we'd look at them and say, if you're going to go back to the States, get more magazines. So this time we kind of thought, well, why don't we do a magazine? And we all looked at each other. And then uh, one of the husbands walked in the room at that time and he said, well, why don't you do that, Sherry? And I thought, well, I've always done publications. Why don't I do it? So uh, the next day I went to my enterprise board and uh, we began the magazine. Talk me through the next step. You went to the enterprise board. What happened then? Well, I was amazed at all the support. So I went to the Enterprise Board and immediately we could do a feasibility study, which is is something that involves a grant. So you know right away you have some support there. The second place I went to was the Irish Patrick Society. They would be a collection of women that that come together um, and they're all quilters. So I kind of wanted to throw ideas out there. What did they think? Would they like a logo? What the logo looked like? The magazine is to be Irish quilting. So it has to have the support and has to have the reflection of the people that quilt in Ireland. So I got together with the society then I went to uh, working with the Enterprise Board. They gave me mentors and we started to work on a strategy of if I get the content together, which is key for a superior magazine that you want to sell in stores. Um, once I could get the content together, we could get it out distributed and go from there as a business. As you say, content is key to the success of any good publication out there. What did you do in that regard to get the relevant expertise on board? Well, that's where I could fall back on my schooling. Um, Basically, as a technical writer, your goal is to pull together the experts, get the content, and then you can get a designer. You know, it's like a lot of project managing. But again, if you surround yourself with the experts, um, and then there's a good bit of testing that goes on. So we would pull in the content. I would actually, for the first two years, it was pretty much myself and a few uh, people that would help me. We'd go to contributors. We'd go to different people that would be influential in the magazine. They might be sewing companies that are going to eventually be advertisers. They might be fabric companies that would eventually sponsor us. They could be designers. We wanted a lot of it uh, from Ireland because obviously it's an Irish magazine. However, in the early, early days, we did go to America. There's a a huge industry there, 21 million people quilt in America. So I was able to kind of tap into that, get some really good contributors supplying patterns and content. I brought it all together and my job is to parse through it and put it in a design um, that would work with the magazine. And and that's what we've done. You gave me some stats there in relation to the US market. Uh, How popular is quilting here in Ireland? It, it's becoming more and more popular every day. Um, so we've been doing the magazine for three years. And um, in the beginning, you know, I had to look through the different guilds. There are three different guilds in Ireland. Um, that would be a society of people that do quilting. Uh, one of them is actually brand new this year. So that shows right there. You've got a third of the guilds and one of them is brand new from January. Um, I think uh, our records, as best we could tell, there are about a thousand quilters. We know there's about 750 registered with the different societies. There's always going to be a quilter of people that do this craft on their own. So we're looking at about a thousand. But it does seem like it's growing as well as it's becoming exposed. You know, it's no longer a thing that two ladies might do at the back. They're actually meeting together. They're having workshops and everything. So it is growing. You had the idea, you developed it, you did your feasibility study, you identified that a market existed for the product, you brought together your expert writers in relation to developing the content. The next step is to get it in front of people, create awareness about it, get it onto the shop floors of news agents across the country and even further afield. How did you go about doing that? 
Well, it's a big task, but if you just take it piece by piece, I think uh, I think most business people, if you can project manage. So, like you said, we went and we got this necessary funds for the first runs, and that would be the print runs. Um, and we knew because the industry is a big industry in America, and because Ireland is a craft, and and I use the word hobby lightly, but at the end of the day, the numbers are small, and we all know that. So we knew if we wanted to be a viable business, we would have to sell outside of Ireland. However, I'm very true to saying this is a robust tool that's used for Irish quilters because we needed it in the first place. But as a business person, I need to get my brand out there and I need the export market to be my my target. So uh, working with the different boards and uh, mentors, I basically approached Eason's, I approached different distributors and I had to give them protege, give them an idea, sell them my vision on it. And they basically came around, they said, you know, there's a niche. This is something you can do. This is out there. You can get it out the market. And that, within three months, we had our first shipment of 5,000 magazines being shipped to America. Um, we had over 1,000 sold in the shop shelves here in Eason's and all these. And then we had the trade shows. So we're the knitting and stitching show in Dublin. This year was the very first Irish quilting festival in Galway. So those would be our big platforms. And in the last three years, we've had a website and we've recently relaunched it. And that brings through a lot of sales. Everyone's getting online and that seems to be an easy access to get the magazine. What are your annual sales working at and what's the percentage of those per country? Most of our sales would be export. So of Ireland, there's about 10% that is sold here in Ireland. We do sell 200,000 magazines yearly. And believe it or not, that's actually a drop in the bucket compared to the American magazines. So there's a lot more growth there that we can expect. Um, it's just we, we are still considered a new magazine on the market. So of our percentages, 10% immediately goes to Ireland, which is where, uh, like I say, I would have created the magazine for. We do sell 80% of the magazines go export. So about 70, 60, 70% are wholly in, in North America. That would be Canada and, and um, United States. The remainder make up UK, South Africa, um, Australia. Australia is a big one. It's growing right behind America. And that, you know, it's it's changed. It, it kind of goes between subscribers, which would be your personal connection where people order the magazine on a prepaid six issues. And then we have store shelves um, and we basically sell them off once off. In relation to subscription base sales, you know, one of the hardest business types to build out there today, they say, is those that need to be subscribed to. Are you finding it difficult to get commitment from people to subscribe to the magazine as opposed to a once-off purchase? It's interesting you say that because I have to say, I always put my hand up, a magazine is a luxury item. And here I am, a business owner, of a, of trying to pitch a luxury item. But we do get subscriptions. We get them daily. Um, I think it's about the quality. We've always had top quality. Um, like any business or any kind of uh, publication you put out there, there might be something that slips through. But we're top on our first reaction would be to, okay, this is good there. I think people when come when people come to us, there's a customer service element. They can trust us. They know from our our content that it's quality. But the other thing they know is that if they have any issues, they can give us a call. It is a lot to ask someone to pay six, six issues or 12 issues ahead. So it's when you're paying ahead, you want to make sure you're going to get quality. It's going to remain quality. It's going to be timely. And it's someone that you've, you've, you've opened a relationship with. So I expect that customer to always feel like they can call us or email us. And once you build those trusts, you can. You get reoccurring sales. And I no, I don't find subscriptions are difficult now. I can appreciate that it is decision consumers have to make if I'm going to pay advance and is this the business I want to pay for? And beyond that, it's also a luxury item. So we're fortunate, but I think we work really, really hard for that. Sherry, from a financial perspective, how does your business model work? Interesting. Um, mainly we work on a distribution basis. So I approach a distributor, show them the magazine. They love it. They want to put it in their shops. Basically, they'll come back with a draw number. So they'll say to me, we think we can sell 5,000. We give them the 5,000. However, we deliver it to them. They send it out and they'll sell it. They'll try to put it on their shelves and sell it. But when the off-sale day is when it, when it comes off, they come back and say, well, of the 5,000, we only sold 2,000. So we now will only get paid on 2,000 after the off-sale date. There's a payment terms. Usually it's 90 days after the off-sale date. So at that time, they'll send me a check and it'll be for 2000 So I, in essence, our business has lost out on the 3000 So it's very important as a business that we structure and manage those orders so that we're lean. But the truth is, in a market, you need to saturate your market in order to get them more sales. So you're always fighting this where you want to send a lot, but you know if you don't sell that, we're going to lose it. It, it reduces the cost of the ones that we did sell. 
That's very interesting. What are the other major challenges in your own business? The other major challenges would be um, just manpower. You know, it's that finesse of managing the contributors and the content that's coming in. The timeliness, um, uh, basically making sure your content is always up to time, uh, up, up to date. Um, and then probably advertisers. I think that's the hardest thing right now, too, is that we're constantly trying to show the value in a, in a tightened economy of how to advertise with a magazine. Like that, we bring in digital um, platforms. If an advertiser advertises with us, we might promote them in another way, our blog, our com, our website, things like that. So it's getting creative with our advertisers so that we can keep them promoting themselves in our magazine, which help pay the print runs and pay to get these magazines out there and distributed. So at this stage, Sherry, the magazine has been up and running four years. Your annual sales are up to 200,000 copies, which is great. What's your plan for the next 12 months for the business? Well, actually, two weeks ago, we hosted our very first workshop here at our at our location in Wexford. And um, what we found is that our name is out there, our brand is out there, people realizing that we're prov- providing this robust tool for quilters in Ireland. And we get calls all the time. People say, where can I find a teacher? Where can I find this fabric? What do you think of this? What do you think of that? We have become the authority of with the authority in Ireland on quilting. Um, and as such, we wanted to see what can we provide to these people that are looking for teachers. So we hosted teachers to come in. Again, we're not experts. We are, are writers and we put the magazine together. We produce a quality project. But at the end of the day, we looked outside and we said, where can we get our teachers? We brought them in and we held a workshop. It was a two-day workshop and um, it went so well that we decided we'll do that quarterly. Well, Sherry, it's been a very informative interview. I'd like to take this opportunity to thank you for coming and speaking to our listeners and wish you continued success with the Irish Quilting Magazine. You're listening to Southeast Radio's Business Matters with Carl Fitzpatrick in association with Wexford Insurances. Think Wexford Insurances for your business insurance.